Shayla Lawson is the author of This Is Major, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle and the Lambda Literary Awards, and two poetry collections. They have written for New York Magazine, Salon, ESPN, and Paper, and earned fellowships from Yaddo and the McDowell Artists Colony. Their new book is How to Live Free in a Dangerous World, a decolonial memoir. They'll be joined in conversation this evening with Janine Cook, owner of Harriet's Bookshop and Ida's Books. Please welcome our guests to the Free Library. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us in Philadelphia. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. And um, I'm like, okay, what do I have to do? I have all these jobs that I have to do right. Um, you got it. <laughs> so I like to start always by asking folks, whose shoulders do you stand on? Right, who makes it possible for Shayla Lawson to be doing, being, having this moment right here, right now? I have to start with my family because, um, so, you know, Gloria and Travis and Ariel, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because without them, my illness would have been so much more challenging mm -hmm. to be able to manage. Um, and, then I'd have to go to my, uh, my boyfriend, Michael, who is, and I'm watching our two dogs, <laughs> <laughs> so that I can go on tour and the babies are taken care of. Um, and then we go into the stratosphere of all the writers that I love. I keep a picture of Gwendolyn Brooks um, right by my bedside. Mm. Um, it's this really fierce picture where she's standing in her neighborhood in between all these clotheslines and just um, looking out into the world. And I think about that a lot because of how much I admire the fact that she always wrote things that her community could still understand mm -hmm. and how important that really is in terms of how we use language. Um, I also think a lot about Audre Lorde and June Jordan. Uh, Toni Morrison, of course. I had just watched Nikki Giovanni reading at the Philadelphia Free Library in her documentary, mm. so I was really honored to be able to follow in those kind of elite footsteps. Mm -hmm. The I could I could do this forever <laughs> <laughs> because they've made me feel so tall. So mm. yeah. Mm. And so we start with how to live free and a dangerous world, yeah. right? And then what I love about it and where I kept sitting with it is a decolonial memoir. And I was like, well, what is a decolonial memoir, right? What, what makes a memoir decolonial? And so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I wanted to think about travel outside of the frame that I'm used to seeing it in book form, which is this relationship to hierarchies and money and the idea that traveling is something that's a, a privilege that reserved for certain classes of people. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to think about the idea that we are all traveling at all times, whether it is just our movement from one room to the other or the space that we're finding ourselves in actual time, mm -hmm. um, the ways that our bodies transition, the fact that I'm in different places is secondary to the idea of what I'm learning in these different spaces and who I'm learning lessons from and how I'm absorbing a better understanding of who I am as a person and coming to and bringing bringing to fruition a like a stronger sense of self-love mm. that I feel has been very much removed from the relationship that so many of us have to our bodies because of colonialism mm -hmm. um, we in the US talk racism a lot um, and sometimes I think we miss the fact that it's not just about race that's keeping us back. It's also boundaries. Mm. It's borders. 
And that's what I wanted to address in writing this book, is what happens if we have more conversations in which we're not just in Italy taking pictures of ourselves in front of the Trevi Fountain because it's cute, you know? We're thinking about what it means consciously to be surrounded by expatriate communities, mm -hmm. um, immigrant communities, you know, integrating ourselves into uh, the, you know, the actual native communities versus the indigenous communities. You know, what, what is it like to actually take a moment and do a bit of service to the community that we're, um, that we're visiting and not just think of it in terms of the place? Right, right. I mean, so I was, the book gave me a lot. It took me all over the world, literally. Yeah. Um, and also all over the world internally. Yeah. Um, and then you, you, you invite us to meet lots and lots of people. And I said to myself, um, I was thinking about this concept of um, Ubuntu mm -hmm. and like, I am because you are, yes. you are because I am. And so can you tell us about a few of the characters, a few of the people we encounter uh, on this world travel? And um, what does you shining light on them say about who you are? Does that question make sense? It does, okay. yeah. Right. I'm about to sit and get comfortable in my chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to go backward. What I'm thinking about is in the chapter on liberation, you meet my friend Kristen, who's a bookshop owner and activist in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense of also the activist community that she participates in. We went foraging as a group to kind of reconnect ourselves to a relationship to the soil, but also a relationship to each other, which was a really beautiful experience. And that chapter is called on liberation because when I think of what freedom means, that's what I think about is what, it, what it's like to inspire each other to, to work together and, and find answers. And, um, and look for food in places that we wouldn't necessarily, that, you know, the fact that there's still beauty and food just surrounding us that we often miss because we've just become so um, siloed into doing things, you know, in, in these separate ways that don't involve community in the same, um, in, in the same level of importance. And then I think about when I ran into my friend Lessa in the, on intimacy chapter. We grew up in Kentucky together. We both happened to be in Kyoto, Japan at the exact same time, and i just come from this remarkably scary theater production, um, just intensely beautiful. Um, it was my first introduction to Butoh, which is a theater that comes out of the bombing of Hiroshima. So the idea is what that impact had taken into this very beautiful artistic context. And the juxtaposition of having that very intimate moment where I, as an artist, had to start thinking about what it's like for people to encounter me on the day to day. And I had the same feeling, I think, that Buteau gave, gave me as an experience, where it was shocking to be confronted with so many truths at one time. Um, I had never thought about that as an artist, that's one of the ways that I approach the world that is often very different than other people. And it was really beautiful to, in that night with um, cocktails with a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in years because she defected to Paris after she got a Fulbright and became a really famous burlesque dancer. So she was there <laughs> to do this Tiffany exhibit where she was going to dance in a giant martini glass. Um, she had these uh, shibari ropes in her in her bag that she almost got stopped in customs for because they were curious why she had all these ropes in her bag. Um, and instead of telling them that she was a burlesque performer, she was just like, oh, shibari sensei. And they allowed her to go. And it was just like a really fantastic moment of uh, understanding the culture that you're, that you're a part of, you know, and the, and the ways that she got to operate differently as this artist. Um, there's a lot of, of stories of love in lots of different capacities. So there's one of my favorite essays is called On Love, and it's about me having to leave New York because my body couldn't handle um, 
what it was like to, to get from place to place in the city anymore. And that was just so similar to that feeling of what it's like to love a city that doesn't really love you back. And then at the same time, um, having like this long-standing unrequited love for a guy who lived in my neighborhood who also didn't love me back. So <laughs> all of that is working <laughs> um, in tandem. Um, and then I begin the book with this story that my family used to tell me back when I was a child about getting to a Prince concert. I was born in, um, I was born in Minnesota um, in a town outside of Minneapolis, and it was one of Prince's first concerts ever. Um, and my parents were huge Prince fans, especially my mom, but there was eight feet of snow outside and there was no way she was not going to this Prince concert. <laughs> and so she um, got my, uh, my father and a friend of theirs to dig the car out of eight feet of snow and they drove through that blizzard and made it to a Prince concert, which was also my first concert because I was in her belly. So it's the beginning um, in this place of what it was like to be in utero and get this lesson of like, you know, the world is gonna be treacherous, dangerous, difficult. You have to fight your way through, but that shouldn't stop you from showing up funky and well-dressed. And that's <laughs> really what I have learned about how to, you know, how to survive, how to live, how to live free in a dangerous world. That is one of my earliest lessons. So those are some of the highlights of the really endearing characters that I've got to come across that get to show up in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I meet, I meet, I was so, um, I was so into the love. I was like, oh, oh my goodness. Yes. I would get another one. And another. <laughs> and another yeah. <laughs> um, and so, okay, book, you know, book after book now, because mm -hmm. there's multiples. Yeah. Uh, essay after essay, poem after poem, uh, country after country. Yeah. What lesson do you keep relearning? What keeps, what themes keep coming up for it's you? It's the loved one. I think that's why. The love feels so present and so gifted is because I have learned so many ways to love mm -hmm. through all of the different transitions that you mentioned. And also just so many ways to admire myself. I remember uh, one of the threads in the book is that I went from being married to getting divorced. And so what that experience was like it shows up in a, a chapter where I also learned how to hula hoop <laughs> as a way to bring some joy into my world. And I think that's, you know, that's one of those great examples of how um, I learned these new ways to find love. You know, picking up a hula hoop in your 30s isn't necessarily the most normal thing to do. Um, but it gave me this sense of confidence and purpose. And then I started thinking about the lesson of what it is to just be able to keep something in movement, mm -hmm. you know, um, at a time where I felt so stagnant and so lost. And I love that I just feel so gifted by the universe, by um, the divine, I often refer to uh, them as the sky mommies for, <laughs> for all these different opportunities that I've had to um, find, find love in this world that so much of the time is filled with so much dissension and so much difficulty. And I just, I love being able to exude that mm. in the stories that I tell. So my friend and namesake is here, Janine. I'm Janine, I and mean, she's Janine. And uh, so we opened, uh, so we have Harriet's in Philly, yes. we have Ida's yes. in South Jersey, uh, there's an RFP to potentially do something in New York that wow. nobody knows about, and then there's Josephine's in Paris, uh, and when we realized that we, really gonna, we were really going to do this Josephine's, I don't speak nobody's French, you, so, you say it in the book too, you was like, I don't speak no French. No, no. <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> I speak no vice for so I was like, okay, how are we gonna do this? And um, and I like to remind myself, like, you know, you're gonna do your part, and then the mothers, or you kind of, you call them the sky mommies, yeah. but they're gonna do their part, and yeah. I don't, we're not responsible for their part. Um, and one of the things that I was doing as we were preparing was saying to everyone, like, listen, we're going to Paris. If you want to come, there's a you can sleep in that extra room in the back. Like, if this is something that's on your heart, if you feel moved mm -hmm. to do it come with us, right? Like, what, what, what's the problem, right? Yeah. What, and why is it a big deal 
right, to to see the world. That should be normal. It's our world, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and I said to Janine, uh, at a party, I said it to everybody in the room, and then Janine came up to me at the end of the party and was like, I'm coming. And I was like, yeah, everybody in the room said they're coming, right? Are you actually coming? And so then Janine lands in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, and she writes an essay about all of the amazing lessons she learned in, in taking that leap. But the my question is about talking to our friends and family about travel who seem to be like, you know, very, very scared. Yeah. I wanted to use this book as a way to write through stories, not just of travel, but just the changing world in Mm -hmm. ways that felt much more tangible for our communities to understand. Um, I wanted to remove that sense that Traveling is difficult, you know. When I when I name the book, you know, how to live free in a dangerous world, mm-hmm. there are just so many ways that the world is dangerous, and some of that is the fear that's been instilled in us about what it's like f- to be in a different place. Because it's so much easier for this country to maintain its control over what we do if we think that we can't go anywhere and be happier. Mm-hmm. And that was something that I really wanted to address. That's a lot of where the decolonizing comes in for us as Americans, is the sense that the world outside is scary when we live in a very scary country Mm -hmm. at a very scary time. And often those of us who are the most sensitive to the fact that this is not the easiest time to be living in this country, if we don't feel like this is a place that is built for us or made for us, We're meant to be travelers. Mm -hmm. There are definitely ways to find community outside of being stuck in one little place. And that doesn't even have to, like traveling doesn't even mean having to go far these days. It can be looking for new groups on the internet that are of interest to you. It can be um, following social media accounts that show beautiful parts of the world that you would love to see, but in in very different ways than you're expecting to see them. We're so lucky because there are so many ways for us to expand our vocabulary of what the world looks like. Um, And hopefully those are some baby steps Mm -hmm. for ways that we can build build out a trail that other people can follow so that they also are interested in in what it's like to be in different parts of the world. Because it is intimidating to go places and the food is different and the language is different and even the side of the street that people choose to walk on is entirely different. But I love that that's also given me this sense of humility for more understanding and thinking about the ways that sometimes this is a better pace of life than what I'm used to keeping or it's actually a little bit safer for me to be on this side of the street as opposed to this one. Actually expanding my mind to think of why people make different decisions in different social um, arrangements has made it so much easier to exist even in this country. Um, And those were the kinds of stories that I really wanted to focus on in writing this book because there's a lot of messy things that happen. There's a point where I'm in Egypt with two of my friends, and uh, one of my friends almost gets gets sold. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, like that's what happens when you you know. And the, the chapter is called on femme, and it's about the expectations of womanhood when it comes to life and traveling, and you know how that expect. And particularly, you know, I come from the south, so it's an ind- additional layer of of. Um, a friendliness that often gets taken as flirtation. Um, but it's really interesting to think just on that level about the fact that um, being in these different spaces, you you have no idea like what, what is possible that could happen. But it made us so much, we were in our 20s. Um, it was one of those situations where it was really exciting to be somewhere and be seen in a way that was very different than, than what we were usually seeing. But I clogged it immediately as, as like a, a kind of visual that I didn't want because I was really used to, I was, be, I was used to being on the road a little bit more than my friends were. But yeah, my friend almost got 
sold to a very rich man in Egypt. <laughs> and I had to, to save her from that. Um, and then there's, you know, just the messiness of my own life. Um, the challenge of going from what I refer to in the book is, you know, the cos the really good cosplay I used to do of being a healthy person to being someone who has become more and more visibly disabled as time has progressed in the ways that that's affected um, my life, my relationships. Um, in the book, I wrote a whole chapter about um, meeting, um, making a really good friend while I was on another tour who um, owns a concierge sex shop and is also a breast cancer survivor. And all the lessons that she taught me in finding love and sexuality and intimacy post realizing that I was a disabled person because nobody talks about that enough you know what it's like when your body starts changing whether it's because of old age or because of sickness or anything else that could happen and how that makes you feel as a sexual person and I loved being able to be ushered into this new world by this beautiful human being who had um curated this wonderful environment and brought me out like a glass of brown liquor and sat me down and just asked me all these questions about how I feel and what I love. And that's how I want the book to feel when it comes to people reading it, is I want them to have that same experience that I had when I was going through something very messy and had somebody just come and envelop me with um, their experience and their care. So those are, yeah, I think those are some ways that would like help <laughs> mm -hmm. so could we talk a little bit about eds and i don't know if that's sure. like okay good i'd love to okay good yeah. thank you yeah um so tell us about it what is it what is it like there's a there's a part where you talk about this woman jill and climbing this hill yeah and you say when she gets to the top of the hill you had no idea how much she was suffering so um oh, but yeah okay, so you tell absolutely. us tell us about the hill you're climbing EDS is a really challenging disease because it's been, um, it's only been diagnosed for the last 20 years. Um, it largely affects women and people of color, so it goes underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed a lot, but it is the version that I have, because there's, there's several, there's about 13 different versions, but the version that I have is a mass joint tissue disorder which often is very difficult for people to understand because I go through different states of disability in this, this constant flux. So my knees dislocate um, regularly, often nearly daily. So I've, I've dislocated my knee today in, in getting here. Um, I just, I'm just recovering from surgery on my rotator cuff because I had torn 50% of it just reaching for a blanket while I was sitting on the sofa. Um, I wear these gloves because my fingers often dislocate. Um, and then there's a whole host of like internal things that are happening. I've, I've had tumors that have had to be removed. I've had lots of different things that will just start happening um, in this very, um, unpredictable way. I think one of the, the the one of the things that kind of stilled my mind and adjusting to the fact that this was going to be my new life was a story that I tell in the book, where a friend of mine who um, has an autoimmune disease, his father was an African scholar, and he used to talk a lot about the ways that these diseases that um, are happening to people that have migrated in, in lots of different contexts, whether it be in an immigrant context or, you know, have it coming from a, a family history of slavery, like what it meant for us to be forcibly moved over here. And he talks a lot about that idea of these genetic transformations being allegories for the ways that we live in the world. Mm -hmm. So my friend with sarcoidosis, as an African-American man, what it means for him to carry all his scars on the inside, you know? And then with me, I have a disease in which I am constantly spreading myself around the world um, and falling apart, even though nobody notices. And mm -hmm. I was like, isn't that a fitting relationship to what it's like to be a black woman, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in this world? And then the flip side of the disease, which is why 
it shows up a lot in the chapter of the book called On Sex, is that um, the best response to my disease is oxytocin and dopamine. So the... Sex. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> that sex is a literal cure, that I can go from... Uh, not being able to walk to walk, you know. Like, so I remember the first time that that happened, uh, which I wrote about in the book. I started sending my friends like this Jesus walks uh, <laughs> gif. I was like, she is risen. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a wild predicament because that also parallels a lot of what is the experience for Black women as well is this removal of affection. Like there's a an in, an endemic relationship to a lack of care when it comes to to black women in um, in America, especially, and it's interesting to have a disease that is almost this perfect allegory mm. for what it means for us to be in this world. And it really helped me to stop and pause because I was burning myself out trying to stretch my arms around the world and show as much love as possible um, when I was deteriorating. And it made me take a step back. I had a doctor who referred to it as the princess disease. Um, and so now one of the things that I love about it is that I have to ask myself the questions of what I can't do. So I'll, I might be reaching for a door, which <laughs> doors are my mortal enemy. <laughs> they really are. Because I have, I have dislocated my arm just trying to get tea out of the microwave before. Mm. So imagine what like a real door is, is like. Um, so it's hard sometimes when, when I'm by myself and I've already got my walker, so I already feel a certain level of, of standing out. In this, and I'm like, I can do it myself. And it's like, no, I can't. Like, I have to rely on the world in these new ways. And I really appreciate that as the lesson that I'm getting out of this is that I have to allow the world to take care of me. And I think particularly as black women, that is something we are terrified to do because we have fallen. We have, wa we have watched people step right over <laughs> us and continue on with the revolution, you know? Um, so it's been, it's been massively informative in terms of how I think about the world. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm learning to appreciate it. And I love the fact that I get to be an advocate for it. It's another one of those places where I feel this level of divine guidance because I did not know, as somebody who has been an activist in so many different capacities, I did not know what it was like to be disabled. Mm. I did not know it is far worse mm. than what it's like to be queer, than what it's like to be black, than what it's like to be born female, than what it's like to you know then come out as non-binary. Like I've, I've run the gamut of possibilities and disability is one of those places that we are the least sensitive mm. to discrimination. And I love having the opportunity to use a platform to say that. Um, the reason why my picture is on the book is because I felt it was really important at a time when we see so many conversations about putting people with disabilities, putting people um, in the LBGTQIA plus spectrum, um, in boxes, you know, trying to hide or remove these things from the world, that we have a book that is going to sit in multiple places for at least a few months, <laughs> um, where on the cover I'm wearing my uh, disability braces, you know, and I've got a tiny little non binary person like painted on my nail, and I am, you know, brown skinned and I still get to traverse the earth, you know? Like that this is this is a a disabled queer black body that is powerful and strong and it was just really cool to be able to make that statement no matter how long or short. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it lives in the the zeitgeist. It's the idea that we're here and that there is a beauty in making those kinds of conversations visible. And disability is one of those places that I really want to work um, hard to, to do as much activism and as much fighting as I can now that I understand what it's like for um, my brothers and sisters and, you know, and my siblings in that world as well. Mm. Mm. Um, 
So I got the signal that I get to ask one more question. But I'm going to ask you questions forever and ever and ever. I'm going to call you. Please do. I would love you. That would make me so happy. <laughs> I'm going to text you. Because I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, I got one more question for now. For now. <laughs> for now. Um, and so the question I want to ask, so what I know you for, what I think many know you for, is incredible writing. Mm. Right, incredible, moving. I gotta read this sentence twenty times. I gotta call somebody and say, "Listen to this. Listen to what she said right here." Um, and you know, one of them. I have so many that I can. You know, my one last question. But anyway, when people have abandoned me, I realize this is sometimes why. Because I was free. I offered my freedom up freely. So how? How did you learn how to be this? free person in this dangerous world and to do it with your writing in, in, in other ways, but with your writing specifically. I saw it was possible mm -hmm. and I saw so few people making that option. And what became easy is that I was never the person that anybody counted on to succeed. People thought wow. so it's not that they thought so little of me. They weren't paying any attention right. to me. And my job was to service everyone else with what strength I had. Um, but what that did for me is that it created inside me this really rich imaginary world in which I was free. Mm. And once I started writing it, I wasn't gonna not live it, you know? It's one of those reasons why I understand like why so many writers go bankrupt. <laughs> my, one of my favorite things, I love going into archives. So I, you know, my favorite tea is old tea. I really want tea that is like, you know, that is steeped for a long time, but it's still hot, you know? And I just remember, Intasake Shange is one of my favorite writers, and I remember going through her archives and finding out about um, a time that she had been bankrupt, and I think about like Truman Capote and the, the money struggles that he had. And I think a lot of that just comes from like once you realize how delicious the world can be, you want as much of it as possible, mm -hmm. you know? And fortunately, the things that I want aren't. I don't want a Gucci purse, <laughs> you right. know? What I do want to be able to do is wake up in the rainforest and hear the birds, you mm -hmm. know? Like, that is, that is my Gucci. And um, finding, finding that, I just felt so connected to the universe. So it didn't matter to me anymore. It hurts, like mm -hmm. it hurts to be rejected by people, to lose people, um, because I value people so highly. I love really, really hard. Mm -hmm. But what I've had to take away is the idea that these are these individual moments that I get to have that I get to savor in this particular way because I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And I get to do them the service of immortalizing their love in different capacities. You know, every time I talk about a conversation that I've had, um, it's because it's somebody that I love dearly, that mm. I just want to make sure it gets remembered in this world, even if it's in a, a tiny way. And then, you know, some of the people that have pissed me off, like they... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't know it's I was like, a writer. You don't want to do that either. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a smart idea. Um, and that, yeah, that power gave me freedom, understanding mm. that power very early, but it came from books. It mm. like. And that's why I am so in awe of what you do, because making sure that we preserve um, the black writing canon, making sure that we preserve this archival material that is the history of ourselves is so important. You know, it's one of those things that I learned by the time I finished this book. I thought of someone like me writing a memoir, an autobiography, as kind of narcissistic and I had worries about that but what changed it for me is thinking about the fact that autobiography saved our lives mm -hmm. it was autobiography that led to um, revolutions like the, Angela Davis's autobiography it's auto in, in which I learned that part of what 
brought her to activism is the fact that the four little girls that were killed in that bombing in Alabama, she went to that church. They were her friends. Mm. And she learned about it when she was away trying to get schooling. And I had a similar experience when I was living in the Netherlands and Trayvon Martin was shot. And um, at the, she, she went to, she was going to a fancy school. She was surrounded by a lot of people who knew nothing about her community. And I, and I got asked the exact same question when Trayvon Martin died and I couldn't get over it by my neighbors, which was, do you know him? And I finally had to say yes, mm -hmm. because it hurt so badly for people to not understand what it was like to grieve um, for your country. And here was a young version of Miss Davis grieving both her country and her friends at the same time. You know, like those kinds of stories changed the world. Um, Mary Prince's autobiography led to slavery's abolition in the UK. Exactly. Um, and that's what. I hope to do with this book. I call it a decolonial memoir because I want to abolish some of the ideas of who is valuable and who's not. I want us to stop miscounting and miscalculating people based on the ways that they don't fit in a stereotypical box and see what happens if we really open ourselves up to what the world looks like now and how many of us are just singularly beautiful in our imperfection, you know, each single one of us. And we're, we're at a time where we can appreciate that. And I think it's important for us to hear that. Mm. Yeah, well, before I open up to questions and you start thinking on your questions, <laughs> uh, I just wanna say thank you so much. Uh, you, what this did for me, what it's doing for me uh, is, is immense. Immense. It's immense to, to, to know that there's a bigger world out there and that I'm invited Absolutely. to the party. Yeah. Um, and that I get to show up and be, what you call it, funky and, and well-dressed. And, and well <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much. And, and, and thank you for showing us that you could, you could tell these publishers, yeah, for nine years that you, this is the book. This yeah. is the book. This it's, is the book. It's going to be hot. Right. Let's do it. Right. <laughs> right. Regardless. Right. So thank you for that tenacity. Because, you know, that's the work of the writer that the folks don't see. And, and we appreciate that. And thank we appreciate you. what you're doing. Hello, it's, it's actually, it's an inquiry. Um, for, 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 for me, somehow, my, my main experience with black women uh, is black women preachers. Mm. You know, it's, 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 while I'm watching you speaking, yesterday there was a similar, similar event. We have two black women, they were talking. Somehow, uh, it, 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 felt, it felt like for you guys, uh, religion is an anathema, something that we are you, we, yeah, religion, you are afraid to come close to it or something. While while, while the, the 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 black woman that I, that I encountered in the community, they are just as almost almost the same the same women sitting on the stage. But those other women that, that really impressed me, the, the women preachers, they were just talking religion, and you guys talk, so, so, so you guys are talking the same thing, but using, the, using different language, you are saying uh, decolonialism. They're saying somehow, just, just to put it in a nutshell, they're saying liberation theology, which started since Martin Luther King, you know what I mean? So, so, so uh, it's really, I, I, don't, I do not really understand black women. <laughs> very passionate, very beautiful, but the same cause. Some people call it liberation theology and they call on God and, you're, right? But you guys are all trying to do the same thing. Mm. Can you talk about the on God chapter? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in relation to... Ways that, to <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny because... So, between you and... Uh, uh, a, a, a black woman uh, preacher, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I wrote a chapter the, the about thing, that. The, the, yeah, there, there, is, awesome. there is an app for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's I'm like, you should hear it, you should hear it, because you're asking yeah. about, yeah. There, so there is a chapter in the book called On God, and it's about the relationship between black, it's, it starts with the sentence, the black woman is God, and it talks about the ways that that has showed up in so many different aspects from the ways that we sing to the ways that we preach. And one of the things that I draw attention to in the book that I don't um, 
that is, you know, when, when we talk about, de so when we talk about decolonial, for instance, my job is to bring people's attention to the things that they don't notice. Um, mm -hmm. Liberation theology is about bringing people into a space where they can receive those ideas. So we are all working towards the same aim in that we believe that this world can be saved mm. and the people in it because we love being alive that much. But it means in the same way that any other divine being is tested that we as a community also deal with a lot of that test because we are so often um, fighting for just our simple right to be people. Mm. But the idea that I was able to trace back to in my work with this book was that if you are looking at Christianity, something that I really struggled with because of the ways that it, has, it was used, particularly in, in African American, well, <laughs> not just African American, the, how it's been used against people of the African diaspora to teach us that we are dirty and the things that we believe are devilish ideas, you know, they've taken away so much of who we are innately. I remember um, when I used to go to church, um, people would would come up, you know, white members of the congregation would come up to me and, and, and pull my braids and say, you know, your mother uses cow dung mm. in order to braid your hair. Because that was their relationship to what it meant to be a black person, that you were dirty, that you were unintelligent, that you um, are a savage. But what I loved in the opportunity to expand my world is that what I, what I came to in this book, which I, I haven't seen written very, very much or often or ever, is that if you really think about Christianity, part of the reason why you hear so much of what you refer to as liberation theology or, or God speech or kind of a, a prophetic tone in, in what you hear of, of black women is because black women would have been some of the earliest people to spread the Christian gospel as well. Because if you think about the trajectory of where Jesus and his apostles started and where they went, they went through North Africa, which is why some of the earliest uh, Coptic Christian churches are in Ethiopia, you know, not in Europe. And these are things that have been erased from the conversation that you're probably not even going to hear a, a liberation theologist talk about because their job is trying to unite the truths that people take for granted. Mine is to uncover the ones that make people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's not what the church is for. <laughs> and that's why you know the church has not necessarily been a place that, um, that works for me as a person. Um, but that doesn't believe, that doesn't mean that I don't deeply, innately believe in God and have such a strong relationship to the fact that that is my heritage, that we will always be um, a godly people, whether that's looking at the fact that the world's largest religion, the Muslim religion, is, is also coming out of that, that the, the same region that all of my ancestors are coming out of, then Christianity is also coming out of those places. You know, we have been steeped in the idea, and then, then we've got like the, the thousands of individual um, worship practices that are coming from, from different tribes. You know, like we, we have always been um, a particular group of people for whom religion has mattered and spirituality has mattered in some, some very, um, some very strong ways. Um, and those are roots that I really like tracing and, and figuring out um, how to tie us back to those conversations of the church, but in different ways. Any more, more? Of course, thank of you. Of course. Thank you for Thank asking. you for your question. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for writing this book um, <laughs> and the reasons that you gave for writing this book. I appreciate it. Um, not just for me, but for the community that you wrote for. Um, so as a writer, yeah. I'm always interested in other writers and their processes. So can you set the scene for us? How do you write? Uh, are you listening to music? Are you, you know, are, are you eating something, drinking something? Are you, you know, like put us in the space. Like how do you create? That's great. Um, one of the things that's been 
a really beautiful experience for me when it comes to this book is that I had to change my writing practice so dramatically because of my health. So writing for me now is dreaming. Mm. It is making sure that I give my body what it needs. One of the delights of being a writer for me now is um, really eating whatever I want. You know, if I want a bowl of pasta at three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, well, my brain needs it. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask any questions. If I need the time to just escape into a different world, whether that's a book or a video game, like I will give myself that time. And I write a lot now um, by recording. So I will, um, often lay in bed because I have to when I'm, you know, as soon as this is over, I am going to hit that bed with a quickness that like you have no idea. But that's so much, um, that's, that's become such a, a, a safe and welcoming space for me because it's the space where I get to stop using so much of my physical energy in the world and then I can just use my creative energy. And I love being able to lie out. I love being able to meditate. I love being able to get in that meditative space and then turn on the voice notes on my phone and just see what happens. And this book became so much different because it was record, mostly recordings that I transcribed. There are some um, essays, for instance, um, on storytelling was an essay that I remember distinctly because I wrote it in a composition book while I was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a time where so many people were rejecting the possibility of my illness taking over my life in, in this kind of a way. And so I got to write this, this dark fairy tale of what it's like to um, walk the earth as a black body that also has to deal with the, the danger that people associate with, you know, with that presence, you know? Um, and it was kind of neat to be doing that in this space that was also so, um, so taboo in certain ways, you know, the ways that we, we don't like to deal with illness or that we don't like to think about people getting sick or having to take a break, so. Um, yeah, and I really encourage um, folks that are struggling with the kind of writing practice where you sit at a desk for 30 minutes a day and that's all you have to do. Um, I love telling my students who might have chronic illnesses or who might be mothers or you know who, who just have, you, know, you, you work a really hard job. Like, what is it like to just, if you're washing the dishes or if you find yourself walking for a little bit, just turn on your recorder and say the thing that you have in your mind that you're waiting to get to a computer or laptop to say? Um, and how would that in increase the amount of writing that you get done? So I'm a big fan of changing the ways that we think of writing being one specific thing. I like that you ask about the, the creative space, you know, because that really is, the most important thing to me when it comes to writing. Hmm. One more? Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you. Let me first say thank you very much for being um, transparent with the earth mm -hmm. because that's what you are right now, transparent to all of us. I wanted to ask, your, is your writing also a healer to you? That's my question. Is your writing healing you while you write? You know, yes. But it's more than just healing. It holds me. Mm -hmm. Writing is the only thing that has always been kind to me. And I feel very blessed for that because writing practices can be very hard. But for me, writing is a mother. Mm. It's, um, it's the water. It's this place that I can enter and just be fully enveloped with creativity and love. It's my dream space. It's, yeah, it is, it is my world. It's, it's my favorite part of myself in this world, hmm. yeah. Wow. And because it's healing, you know, not because if, of, 
you know, of who reads it or, you know, or where, you know, or where, where I get to be or where I get to sit. But when you were mentioning that, the first thing that came to my mind is what it was like to get into the ocean in Senegal. Um, I specifically went because I wanted the opportunity to stitch back together that relationship with my unidentified family from the middle, middle passage. And I really wanted the opportunity to just sit in the water and talk to Yemenya and look up at look up at the sky and say how grateful I am for that return. That all of the bodies like mine that were lost tragically, whether through mental or physical um, disparagement, I'm still here. You know, mm -hmm. we're still here. And so it feels like a larger healing circle than even just my physical body. It feels like a way to deal with the kind of metaphysical healing that we need as humans so that we can all come together. Um, I really, that's what I really want more than anything is for all of us to heal. Wow. So on that note, we say thank you so much. Uh, our book tonight, How to Live Free in a Dangerous World, yeah. by the amazing, I, I call you philosopher, <laughs> 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 Shayla Lawson. Thank you so much for your Thank you. <laughs>